Just to make sure that everyone is in the right room, we're here for Azure dur Durable Functions. Yeah? Cool. Everyone is actually awake. That's also good. First session of the day, always, uh, always a bit of a challenge. For those of you uh, who don't know me, my name is Jaap. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Harness. We, uh, we are a software delivery company, so we do a lot with CI, CD. So yeah, that's what I use to deploy my uh, my Azure, uh, my Azure functions. But we're not going to talk about uh, CI, CD that much today. Uh, we're going to focus on Azure functions. And uh, just to get an idea for the room, uh, how many people have already created an Azure function? OK, that's quite a lot of people. How many people have created a durable Azure function? Well, that's still, a, still a fair amount. Cool. Um, yeah, so aside from uh, being here today, uh, I do a fair bit of coding. I've been active in the, in the PowerShell world for, uh, for a while, and that's also why I figured that uh, Azure Functions, as soon as PowerShell was officially supported, I started uh, playing around with it, finding, uh, finding its limitations, and trying to work with it, and sometimes work against it to, uh, to get things done. Um, so what we'll be covering today um, since not everyone has used Azure Functions or might not be completely familiar, we're going to dive uh, a bit into uh, what Azure Functions are. Uh, and from that point on, we'll build, uh, we'll build up to durable functions. What kind of considerations do we have? What does it look like when we're, uh, when we're developing, uh, when we're creating durable functions? How can we create them? Uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of resources do we need? And then we have some example functions uh, with a bit of uh, bit of live coding at the end, and, and of course a lot of uh, a lot of demos. Uh, if anyone has a question at any point, uh, just raise your hand or shout uh, shout uh, shout out my name. Um, yeah. So first of all. Why would we actually care about, uh, about Azure Functions? Uh, this is uh, my quacka, Roger. I, I was supposed to bring him along to, uh, to this trip, but I, uh, I totally forgot about him. Uh, I'm a terrible parent. Mm -hmm. But uh, th the reason I got started with, uh, uh, with serverless is actually similar to uh, why, I'm uh, why I became interested in PowerShell and automation is because I wanted to care less about, uh, uh, I, I want to care less about the platform that I was working on and more just about getting the job done. And for some specific tasks, uh, Azure Function is quite a, quite a powerful tool. It was my initial, uh, my initial way of, uh, of writing scripts uh, was just to, uh, uh, just to run them either on my local machine or uh, back in the days just spin up a, VM in Azure and just have it running 24 hours a day to execute once a day. So very efficient. So we have some benefits there, and that's what uh, that's what serverless provides uh, for us. So you we will abstract to, uh, it abstracts away the the servers. It's event uh, event driven. So uh, that both means that you can use events to trigger uh, to trigger and um, to trigger an execution of your Azure function. Uh, but it also allows you to scale uh, on demand, and that is something that uh, that, that is a very big, uh, very big benefit. And it's a pay-as-you-go, uh, which also has some caveats because once you start making mistakes in your code, it can become progressively more expensive if you do it with uh, with Azure Functions compared to just maxing out your uh, your VM. So Azure Functions uh, itself, it comes with uh, a whole bunch of supported languages. Of course, .NET is the, the number one, uh, the number one uh, citizen. The, most, of the, uh, most of the best functionality is available. There's also uh, 
partial functionality in uh, uh, in PowerShell durable functions. We don't have access to all the other methods there. Node, Java, uh, PowerShell, Python, and it also used to include batch scripting, but it's no longer there. Although you could probably just still uh, hack it together in there. So creating Azure functions themselves. Uh, the configuration of Azure functions, if you just look at what you get on your file system, it's just a bunch of JSON files. And then in addition to that, some extra JSON files and, uh, and a bit of code. The functions themselves, they live uh, inside uh, function apps. So if you have an Azure function, the container above that are the, uh, the function apps. And the function apps, they live within, uh, within app services in, uh, in Azure. Uh, I mentioned events, so uh, Azure Functions trigger uh, uh, trigger based on certain uh, certain events. So common ones are timer. Uh, another one is just manual, where you just click the button to uh, to start it, or an HTTP trigger. HTTP trigger is in general my uh, my favorite interaction because it allows you to interact with other API endpoints, and API endpoints can interact with uh, with you. So getting into the, the triggers, uh, the triggers and bindings. So the triggers I just mentioned, the bindings uh, are also uh, uh, Azure Functions concept. It allows you to uh, to define the in and outputs of your uh, of your functions. It's also more JSON, and here's one of the examples where we uh, bind it to a queue trigger and a table. Then. When we get to deploying uh, uh, Azure Functions, we have a number of options. Uh, number of options available. We can do it through the portal, which is okay to do the first time you're uh, you're working with Azure Functions. Can use VS Code or just Visual Studio itself. Can use the Azure Cloud Shell or just any kind of command uh, command line interface to just uh, use Azure CLI or the uh, the Azure PowerShell modules to uh, to deploy. Uh, you can. Uh, you can pull it in uh, from GitHub or other uh, other external repositories, upload it as a zip or uh, to CI/CD pipelines. Uh, using pipelines is in general recommended once you start start going more towards a production environment. Uh, when you're playing around, uh, it's usually a bit overkill to uh, create an entire pipeline. So there's a number of hosting plans available, consumption-based, premium-based, and app service uh, plans. Uh, for personal use, the consumption plan is uh, more, more than enough for, uh, uh, for most activities. I don't think I've ever been charged for Azure Functions. The one thing to keep in mind is the storage that you use and the application insights, you do get charged for that if you uh, enable that. But other than that, I think it's the first 500 minutes or something in that range. Uh, 500 minutes of uh, of runtime a month is uh, is free. So I al alluded to this before. There are some coding practices to keep in mind, and this is language agnostic, but in general just good uh, good advice for uh, writing in any kind of uh, serverless uh, uh, any kind of serverless functions. So you don't want long-running functions. You want the functions to just have a single purpose. It's not one giant monolithic, uh, one giant monolithic script like we uh, like we used to create when we were doing uh, infrastructure management. We want it to be uh, stateless. Uh, item potency. I'm sure you heard it uh, enough by now because it's been mentioned in uh, almost every talk. So what we mean is. If we execute the function again, we want it to uh, yield exactly uh, exactly the same uh, result. And writing defensively uh, ties back to make sure you don't uh, write functions that will either break and which cause them to fail, or um, uh, uh, or the, the the practice there is make sure that you account for failure because. Uh, the only thing that's certain when you're writing any kind of code is that eventually it will fail at uh, at some point, and definitely in my case because my code always uh, always fails. The next one, uh, networking. There's some uh, th we have some options available there. 
I haven't uh, run into uh, a lot of issues with the consumption plan in regards to uh, in regards to the options that are available. But once you start uh, uh, using them at a enterprise level, it might be uh, it might be nice to put it behind a behind a VPN. So then we'll talk a bit about the limitations that we have. Uh, concurrency is something that we, uh, and these are not limitations of, uh, of Azure functions uh, themselves, but of, uh, of the language we use. So concurrency uh, can be a bit challenging in PowerShell. Uh, we, d we don't have async statements. If you're familiar with, uh, with .NET or, uh, or JS or any of those languages. Uh, so uh, accounting for failures is something that you, we have to keep in mind. And because it is running, uh, it's no longer running on your own, uh, on your own hardware, uh, troubleshooting is also something that you uh, have to reinvent when you're, uh, when you're working with Azure Functions. And the other thing to keep in mind, uh, if you're on a consumption plan, uh, you're, uh, if you haven't uh, reached out to your function, it can go to a cold state and then it can take uh, hundreds of milliseconds up to a couple of seconds before it actually becomes available. So that is something to keep in mind when, uh, when working with Azure Functions. So what I'll do now is I'll go into a demo, show a bit of uh, what is possible with uh, Azure Functions. Uh, but before I dive in, the, in there, uh, any questions so far? Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm actually not entirely sure because there have been recent changes to Azure Automation. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Repeat the question. Thank you. Oh. So yeah, the the question the question was uh, what are the differences between Azure Automation and Azure Functions? The last time I touched Azure Automation, it was still running Windows PowerShell. I'm not sure if it has been migrated over now. Uh, yeah. So uh, for um, for Azure Automation, sort of the old granddaddy service, you know, it's been around forever. Um, it runs on Windows, but you can't actually use PowerShell 7 with it now. Um, the main differences are that uh, Azure Automation is really good for those sort of task-based scripts, like, you know, it's, it's your task scheduling in Azure, like for any kind of thing. Well, you can use webhooks and that kind of thing. It's also really, really good for doing hybrid things, like if you still have an on-premise architecture, the way that the hybrid stuff works in Azure Automation, if you have stuff you need to run on premise, you can do that with Azure Functions, but it's a lot more complicated and a lot more expensive. And Azure Automation makes that really simple. Where Azure Functions is really useful is when you have stuff that needs to execute really fast, um, you want a really nice uh, development environment because developing for Azure Functions, if you've ever, excuse me, for Azure Automation, if you've ever tried to do any kind of modules or anything like that, you know importing it's a real pain. And it just has to do with like some of the legacy stuff that's there. But basically, you know, in short, is Azure Functions is really good for building really nice scalable applications that are survivable and scale out automatically in and out using all the cool input and output bindings, which Yop will talk about, I'm sure. And um, Azure Automation is really good for, like I said, for like being that like task test scheduler. For when you have those scripts you need to run on a regular basis to do certain tasks or respond to certain things, but you really don't care about how long it takes or where it runs or how survivable it is. Um, that's, in my opinion, the best differences, so. Yeah, I, uh uh, I agree with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> but well, uh, one question: I, uh, the, the hybrid, uh, the hybrid workers, are they still going to be uh, still going to be around? Because I saw something uh, in my Azure Automation recently that they were outdated. But maybe I have old ones. Yeah, I, I didn't see anything. Maybe the agents are older, but I don't. I don't think they're being yeah, deprecated. Are they? Yeah, as the run, run as. That's the uh, yeah. okay. So one of the new things in Azure Automation is you can use managed identities now. So the problem with run as accounts is they're basically like like um, an application ID. And by default, they get contributor to the entire subscription, which is not great. So now we have managed identities, which is a much better way to do it. They're much more secure. They don't have to have a key that gets rotated. It's just nicer that way. So, you know. Sorry. Yep. They're also changing the technology from the old Google agents to the Azure Marketing agents. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing they're Okay. They're cool. Sweet. 
it's, uh, it's, it's always great to have the actual experts in the, in the audience. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll uh, go take a look at some, uh, some Azure functions and just the basics, what it, uh, what it looks like. Sweet. Uh, all right. So we'll go take a look uh, in the Azure portal. I'll make it a bit bigger. I'll verify myself, see if it's big enough. So what we have here is an HTTP trigger. That's not really big enough yet. Uh, that's an HTTP trigger. And the goal of this, uh, of this function is, is to just return an uh, SFG file uh, to have some automatically uh, generated images for, uh, for the website. I got started with that when I saw the, the cool tokens, uh, the, the cool counters, the, the Vista counters you could have on your GitHub profile. But it was running on a free service, so it didn't work half of the time. So then I, uh, I made my own on, uh, on Azure Functions. And this one is part of that, uh, of that system. So all it does is it injects uh, whatever uh, we tell, uh, w whatever string we put in there, it will create an image out of it. So we can see here, so now it returns YAP and PowerShell. It's also very good that I uh, share my key on screen. So we'll change it to WL. So we can see if we run it again, are we connected to the internet? Yes. Come on. There we go. You can see that the image, uh, that the image uh, updates. You can also change the color on this one based on the, uh, based on the color variable. So that's just hexadecimal. Don't know the colors by hand, but we can see that we can uh, update it like this. So this is just a short function. We'll take a look at uh, what that looks like uh, from the code point of view. So we can see uh, here uh, it has some right hosts. We, uh, we have a parameter block where we have the request and the metadata. We uh, split this one up so we can get first, second, and color, assuming they are, uh, they are available. And then we inject that uh, with string formatting to, uh, to put the words and the color coding uh, into the SFG file. So it's uh, pretty simple. And what we can do from the portal as well, we can also uh, we can also specify the response here. But the downside of that is that we won't be able to see uh, we won't be able to see the image. That's ooh, wrong button. That's the downside of being zoomed in. Get back over there. And if we click here, we give it a second. Uh, in the portal, usually the things stay grayed out for a little bit before they realize that they should actually not be grayed out. Come on. Oh, there we go. Sweet. And then the next thing is that if we want to see what it looks like here, we can do code and test. And we'll also connect to the logging interface and we can actually see what happens uh, when the code gets executed and it uh, provides a bit of basic troubleshooting. Come on, conference Wi-Fi. Hmm. I'll um, leave this one for, uh, for what it is then. So, Going back into our uh, function app itself, uh, you can see that inside the function, uh, inside the function apps, we can uh, choose the function apps that we want. So I select the power, uh, the PowerShell one. As I mentioned before, our functions are uh, stored in here. Uh, as soon as it uh, showed them, you can see we have multiple there. From a configuration point of view, 
uh, we have that uh, available here as well, also in code. So what is important to note about uh, this, uh, this specific function app is that I completely deployed it to the portal. That's why I'm able to also change the code uh, in the portal. That's an okay thing to do when you're, uh, when you're doing a demo. But in general, when you want to be deploying your Azure functions, uh, my go-to way is do it, uh, uh, to do it through VS Code and just deploy directly uh, from VS Code. And how that works is it just uploads uh, the functions as packages, and then they're no longer able to be changed in the, in the portal. Uh, yep, so we can see a couple of things here. Uh, we can see our function uh, runtime uh, runtime version. So we're currently on version three. So I've been getting a lot of banners that I should upgrade this one to four. Uh, for Azure durable functions, we need uh, we need to be on runtime level uh, four. Um, the last one we have is we're going to take a look at this function. Here we go. So we have another one. This one, uh, this one will return some nice ASCII art. And while this one's loading, I'll actually execute the code. So I'll just call it directly from PowerShell. There we go. So we can see we can just use invoke REST method uh, with PowerShell to get output from our uh, function, and we get a nice cat in the in the console. Not very useful, but uh, I do like a bit of art in my console. So if we take a look at our monitoring, uh, we have a couple of options there as well. And that one's too slow. I'm uh, not going to be waiting for that one. Cool. So with that out of the way, uh, any questions about Azure Functions uh, themselves? All clear? That's, uh, that's fantastic. So let's get into uh, the real meat of it then, the durable, uh, durable functions. Um, yeah, I already asked people uh, who is using, uh, already used durable functions. There were a couple of people on this side of the room. Uh, what are you currently using durable functions for? Is just experimentation? Whoever, uh, okay, some people experimentation. Yes? Good, uh, good question. Uh, so a durable Azure function, that's also what we're going to uh, get into now. A durable function is, um, I think I'll just go to my slides and then build, build, up, <laughs> build up to it. <laughs> but the idea is that instead of just having your, uh, 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 this, the situation you're in, if you're just using Azure Functions, is you can have an Azure Function that calls another Azure Function, that calls another one, and that are all interacting with each other. But if one of them fails, there's no, there's no system in place to make sure that either it gets executed again, there's no, there's no error handling uh, that you have on the, on the scale of interactions between your functions. And what durable functions uh, provides for you is it provides an orchestration, uh, an orchest orchestration layer. So you have a, 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 a number of different durable functions and that are these. Uh, so we have client functions. So client functions is what you would directly uh, directly interact with. So this could be your uh, your HTTP trigger in order to uh, to start your uh, to start your orchestrator function. Your orchestrator function uh, is basically your your script that will uh, that will detail how the functions are called. You can put your error handling in there uh, and what determines what kind of uh, what kind of type of uh, what type of uh, durable function you're creating? Because there's uh, different ways that you can go and different uh, uh, di different sort sort of deployment. 
There's also entity functions. Entity functions are, I'm not sure if it's exclusive to .NET. It is definitely available in .NET, but it's not available for PowerShell. But I mentioned that they exist uh, uh, because they do exist. And the activity functions, that is what, uh, uh, what the Azure functions were that I uh, that I showed before. So the uh, the cat function that would be an uh, activity function or any kind of function that uh, that is called by uh, by the orchestrator that those would be your uh, activity uh, activity functions. So the question was, uh, what is the difference between Azure functions and Azure durable functions for the recording? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sweet. Anyone else? Okay. So, uh, orchestrator functions uh, have a number of actions that they can take. So they can uh, uh, they can execute the uh, activity functions. Uh, there's the possibility for sub orchestration. So if you're starting to build out more complex. Uh, uh, more cl complex situations in which you use uh, durable functions, you can work with sub or or uh, orchestrations. Not available for PowerShell durable functions. Um, you can have it wait for uh, external events. It can uh, it can be uh, it can do HTTP requests. Timers can be in there. Um, there's a number of uh, a number of constraints as well. So some of the constraints that we have with uh, with uh, with orchestrator functions is things have to be deterministic, and the reason for that is that uh, uh, what what the orchestration function does for you, if one of your uh, if one of your functions fails or an execution fails or one of the uh, one of the nodes on which your uh, your activity, so your Azure function uh, within the durable function was running crashes for some reason, uh, it will try to restart the job with the same kind of parameters. And if you have uh, non-deterministic uh, non -deterministic values within your orchestration function, uh, it, will not play, uh, it will not play nice and it uh, will get you into uh, uh, situations where the orchestrator does things that are quite unexpected. So what it means for us is, uh, there's a bunch of wrapper functions available. So, for example, with get date, you would use uh, context current uh, current date, and there's wrapper functions for all the all the different languages as well. That's one of the PowerShell examples. Also, uh, uh, in a similar vein, no uh, no random data. So, if you want to generate uh, GUIDs or UUIDs or any kind of randomness, uh, you can move that towards your activity functions instead of uh, inside of your uh, your orchestration. Is that all clear? Sweet. Uh, the last one is infinite loops. Uh, also a bad idea. Can be a good idea, depending what you, uh, uh, what, what you're trying to uh, achieve. But infinite loops, uh, in some scenarios, means infinite money. But unfortunately, not infinite money for us, but infinite money for Microsoft. So try to avoid accidental uh, infinite loops. Uh, one of the uh, what, one of the scenarios that uh, that I had was that I didn't realize that uh, an object was referring back to itself when I kept iterating uh, to all the properties of an object. And uh, one of the one of the properties referred back to the object, so it would keep on going and keep on going and keep on going. Sorry? Context? Uh, no, it was not the context property. It was, uh, what was I doing again? I, I think I was working with Outlook mailboxes and there was one property that referred back to the mailbox itself. So then I thought I discovered a new mailbox, but it was the same one again, and then I would iterate over it again. And the nice thing about it was that for every mailbox, for every single email, I would spawn a new process. So there were a lot of processes spawning. And then all of a sudden everything started timing out because 
Azure Functions can scale quite well, but if you, if you push it to the limit and you start having millions of executions simultaneously, you're going to get throttled. Because the moment you start bringing down a data center, that is, uh, that is of course, not, uh, <laughs> not what, uh, what anyone wants, uh, let alone, uh, let alone uh, Microsoft. So then we have a number of uh, patterns that we uh, can create. So the patterns that I'm talking about are uh, the, the patterns uh, as you can set it up in your um, in your orchestration uh, uh, in your orchestration uh, durable function. Uh, so we have function chaining. This is uh, th this was actually the first use case for which I started using durable functions because I had a number of functions that were feeding into each other. And I also had failures uh, within those functions. And I tried to create the logic within each individual function to deal with the next one failing. failing. But uh, after a while, that's not very maintainable because you, you end up with an enormous amount of boilerplate co code in your functions. And it goes against use less code in your functions. So um, this one is. Uh, Quite useful in situations where, uh, like, your your first function uh, outputs the data, the second function uh, picks it up based on the uh, queue trigger or storage trigger. Second function fails. What the orchestrator would do is it will take uh, uh, it will take the state that uh, all the functions were in. It will restart uh, function number two, get the data out again, and push it. Uh, push it onto uh, function three. So that is what uh, uh, durable functions provide for us. Next one is pan out, pan in. That's the situation that I just described where uh, I was iterating to mailboxes and to users. Um, it's a, a big benefit of uh, Azure functions and serverless in general is because you can so easily uh, scale uh, scale outwards with uh, uh, with durable functions, uh, but, but with uh, with serverless in general. Um, kind of lost. <clears throat> so uh, it allows you to. Uh, uh, to uh, rapidly scale out and then uh, put a hold on, uh, uh, de depending how you create it, either uh, wait for all the all the output to be there, or uh, start uh, start inputting the output into the the follow up function. So this is uh, quite useful for situations where uh, where you might uh, where you uh, need to work with huge amounts of data. So if you're thinking about migrations or uh, extracting a lot of data out of, uh, out of a tenant or subscription, and you would want to apply it somewhere else, uh, the, the fan, fan in, fan out model uh, is quite, uh, quite useful. In the demos later on, uh, these are the two that will uh, mostly, uh, mostly go into. And uh, for my personal use cases, those are the uh, the most uh, the most common one. Next one we have is uh, asynchronous uh, uh, functions. So these are uh, generally used for uh, longer uh, longer running functions. Uh, an example for this one is uh, we all use OneDrive, right? Or we at least are familiar with what OneDrive is. So if you're on OneDrive and you click uh, uh, you, you select two files and you click download. It takes a second before it says there's a download link now. So that is uh, done using an uh, asynchronous, uh, asynchronous function. Or you, you could achieve the same thing with an asynchronous uh, function. Then we also have a monitoring uh, function. Uh, monitoring function, uh, it's the wrong image, this uh, human interaction uh, image. But the monitor function is just a function that uh, uh, monitors the output and takes, uh, takes action based on that. Then we have uh, the human interaction. 
So that's for approval flows, for example. Uh, not something that I've uh, gone into a whole amount. Uh, in general, in these kind of cases where uh, uh, I have approval workflows, I think uh, Power Automate is a very, uh, very powerful tool for those kind of interactions. So I haven't really found a specific use case to uh, to apply with uh, with Azure uh, Azure Functions. And then the last one, the biggest one. That is the aggregator, and that is when you're ingesting uh, big amounts, uh, big amounts of data into your um, uh, into your uh, into your Azure uh, Azure functions. So, any questions about the different uh, the different patterns here? Alrighty. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the, there's a couple of resources. So switch ahead to uh, one of the slides that I have here. Uh, there's Azure Functions uh, University. That's a general good resource to learn about uh, about Azure Functions, including durable functions with all the different language models. Uh, there's uh, function samples available in uh, docs.microsoft if you uh, if you type uh, if you if you search for durable functions uh, samples you'll uh, end up there and th those are uh, both on github and on the microsoft docs and the question was what's a good resource for uh, uh, for learning more uh, about uh, the different patterns and the nice thing is that there's uh, there's samples. Sorry. Ah, yes. So the question is, do you have any kind of control over um, uh, over how much you scale out? Uh, yes, you do. Uh, that is what you define in your in your orchestrator uh, in your orchestrator function. So your orchestrator function is just a PowerShell uh, just a PowerShell script. So it is, however, you would normally control it when you're writing a script. That's exactly the same uh, ability you have uh, with, durable, uh, with durable functions. And that can indeed be a smart thing to do, because then you don't end up in a situation like me where your entire uh, tenant gets bottled, because you might not have done the smartest thing. Does it answer your question? Sweet. Cool. Well, then we'll uh, go take a look at uh, what it takes to uh, get started with Azure Durable, uh, Azure Durable Functions uh, through the magic of, uh, of demos. And for everyone here, uh, if you have a question during the demo, I'll probably be looking at my screen so I won't be able to see your hand. Just shout my name, or if you see someone else raise their hand, then also shout my name. Thank you. So the first thing we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll take a look at what we've set up in uh, in VS Code in order to uh, to get started with uh, uh, with Azure Functions, uh, Azure Durable Functions specifically. Yeah. <coughs> How's that? Uh, yeah. So getting started with uh, uh, with durable functions, uh, obviously we need to uh, we need to create a function app in order to be able to deploy our functions too. One of the recommendations is also to create a uh, uh, to create a, store, uh, a storage account specifically for your durable functions. Uh, it will be used for. Uh, for storing all kinds of runtime logging uh, logging information on there, 
it will automatically prompt you the moment you start the durable function uh, project. So getting started with a durable function is uh, Azure Functions Durable. So what we would do here is we would <coughs> create a new uh, create a new project, and that is what we are uh, currently in. This is our uh, this is our pro uh, product uh, project that I created. So we have uh, we have three uh, functions created. So we have our starter uh, our starter function for the chaining. So the chaining was the was this approach where we chain multiple functions into each other. So we have our starter function. We'll take a look at what is uh, configured here and what is different compared to regular, uh, uh, regular Azure functions. So we can see that there's a number of durable, uh, durable uh, commands in there that are specific to Azure durable uh, functions. So our starter function is, uh, this is just the boilerplate version of it. We pass in the name of whichever function we want to, uh, uh, we want to execute. So we do, do that by specifying the function name. And then it will start our orchestration for us. So in our case, uh, in the function chaining example, you can see here, Side. You can see here that a very simple uh, example of this is we just get all the output and we get the output from uh, a single function. The function is called getter data and it will input, uh, it will give this as input to gather the data. Our function itself does not actually uh, gather any data. All it does is it will just spit out whatever you put in there. But it's just to illustrate what would happen if you would uh, set this up as an orchestrated function. So then, after we create these functions, uh, we have the option to deploy it to a function app. So currently, it's already uh, deployed. But we can see that we have a durable chaining demo. And that's where we will go take a look at now and see what it looks like, uh, what the durable function looks like uh, in the Azure portal, and how we can uh, how we can execute it. There we go. And before I go into the durable function itself, uh, what we'll do here is. Uh, I mentioned that there was a storage account uh, that will be created the moment you uh, get started. And if you take a look here, you can see that the moment uh, you start working with your, uh, uh, with your, uh, with your functions, it, start, it creates a number of queues and tables uh, with all the data in there. So if we take a look here, we can see that all the functions that we had uh, on our system uh, uh, in VS Code, I mean, uh, are also available here. Pull up code next to it. There we go. So, in order to uh, be able to start uh, our uh, function, we would do an HTTP request to this one, uh, our starter function. So we can see now that we also get the warning because we didn't deploy it uh, to the portal, we deployed it uh, uh, to VS Code. So you can see that we can't actually make any changes here, so which is. Yes, it's uh, it's similar uh, if you're uh, if you're deploying your. Uh, you, you can also uh, put all of this configuration directly on Git uh, on GitHub, and then the moment uh, you, you can set it up to a GitHub action. But the moment you uh, do a new commit to whichever branch you specify, it will automatically uh, package everything up and import it as a new uh, uh, into the function uh, app. 
And that's essentially what, uh, what PS Code is also doing for us. Uh, ev everything we see uh, over here on the side, it will package it up uh, and uh, put it into the function app so we can, uh, can work with it. So the main difference here is that if we go to code and test, we, we won't be able to, uh, to make changes here. But on the other hand, you don't really want to be coding in, uh, uh, in this interface because it isn't, uh, it isn't fantastic. We can take a look at it, though. So now if we wanted to uh, run this, we can uh, go for test run. We can enter our chaining function name, and then we would, uh, then we would be able to execute the function. So then if we go, let's see, from here, we would go to the orchestration here, and see we haven't had any executions in the past hour. So let's take a look at, oh, this is. You can see our uh, our trigger here is the orchestration uh, context and the orchestration chaining. So now, if we uh, would like to go for uh, some additional uh, functions, and we want to, for example, go for fan in, fan out. Uh, oh, so this one. We'll create some new durable functions now to give you an idea of what it looks like uh, if you want to create your own functions uh, from scratch. So we can. Oh. We can create a new function. So we can see here create Azure function. Unfortunately, that is not the correct one that we need. So we can do uh, create durable. Uh, oh, what well, it is function and then we have an option for uh, the HTTP starter or the durable functions uh, orchestrator so in this case we already have the HTTP starter because we can reuse the starter chaining because we didn't hard code any uh, any value in there so what we'll do is we'll get started with a uh, uh, with an orchestrator and then we'll go for uh, this approach, so we're going to fan out and fan back in, and see what we can uh, see what we can do with that. So we call this fan out and in. So. Currently, it is not a uh, fan in, fan out approach yet. I'll just take some of the action from this one. So then, what we do here, let's get it all on screen. So we have our parameter block for the context. In this case, uh, we have uh, the parallel tasks here. So we can see, uh, I just do a simple uh, 1 to 10. Then I wanted to call a function. So uh, we haven't created the activity function yet, but uh, we will call it fan out, fan in, gather. And as the input for that, uh, in this case, we'll just use uh, 1 to 10. Because I know that for uh, for the purpose of uh, of this demo, I'll be using uh, uh, th these values will actually uh, give us some data. So we can see we do invoke durable activity, and for the output, uh, we would uh, uh, wait for the uh, uh, wait for all the parallel tasks to be completed. So at the moment, we uh, we don't have any kind of uh, concurrency control. Uh, 
So if we would do a thousand, it would simultaneously fire off a thousand Azure functions. So if you're in the development, uh, in the development uh, part of your uh, of your journey, probably don't start with the biggest number possible. And uh, for uh, for fan in, we're actually not fanning in. We're just uh, verifying how many uh, results we have and uh, give us uh, that as output. So this is fan out. So now that we have this one, we also want yes. So, uh, that's a good, uh, that's a good question, I think. Mm, do, yeah, the, so the question was, how can we actually implement concurrency control, yes? Yeah. So, uh, for, for the recording, uh, no, nothing built in as far, uh, uh, as far as we know, but we can inspect the queues and see what is uh, what what is concurrently uh, running. Was there a question? Cool. All right. So we have our uh, our orchestrator function. So next up, we're going to create our uh, our next function, our activity function, to actually get something out there. So we create a new function. You can see that there's a lot of options available, but we'll go for an activity. So our activity functions are our uh, uh, workers. In this case, get, uh, get Pokemon. And the reason it's called uh, get Pokemon is because we have an API endpoint that we can make it a little bit bigger. And what we have here is that we can uh, use those numbers that we have uh, to illustrate what would happen if we, uh, uh, if, we would, uh, if we would iterate through that. So the number one will actually refer to an existing Pokemon. And we'll use this as a mock example to uh, see what is possible with, uh, with data collection using the fan, uh, fan out approach. So we have our URL here. So we'll update this. Uh, we will update our worker function with an ID, and we'll use invoke rest methods. So bonus question: Why would you use invoke rest method over uh, invoke uh, web request? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, correct. And uh, in in general, uh, invoke web request also has a bit more uh, a bit more overhead because it tries to parse uh, parse the data more. Uh. Yeah. Okay. So the question is: is the is the context? If you make changes to the context in one of the the child uh, the child activities, does that flow uh, back up as? Yeah. So I, as, as, far, uh, as, as far as I've experienced it, it's the, the child scope does not make changes to, uh, to the parent scope. So any changes you make in that scope uh, are just uh, within that activity function or whatever the, the function is. But if anyone can, uh, can correct me there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hello again, guest speaker here, Justin. Uh, so the thing you want to know about the context object is it's it's dynamic for depending on what it's basically the collection of what your input bindings are. So dynamic, the whole way that durable functions work is they take a lot of the input output binding stuff that you would typically do and then just hide it all from you under the scenes. So really what it's doing is behind the scenes it's getting an input binding from a queue or a blob when you do like your push and then it'll under the scenes like drop that into a queue which then connects to your other function. That's why all these commands have to be kind of stateless, is because it's just running the same script over, but there's no state that carries over. To. So to shortly answer your question, that context is basically just when you get it, if you change anything in there, it's only going li to live for the lifetime of that script. Unless you do something like a push output binding to drop that somewhere so that the next time the script runs, 
again, it's a fresh instance and it's only depending on what it gets from those input bindings, which is just dynamically done for you with the durable function. At, at that time, then, you know, if you were to push to change something that way, then that will show up in the next execution. But uh, as far as the context object itself, you, if you do like, yeah, like, if it's like dollar context dot my parameter, if you change that to like my parameter equals something else, that's not going to carry through to the next function. It will for the current invocation, but like the next thing that picks that up, it's the context is going to be whatever it is based on the durable function. So does that make sense? Sorry. Yep. yep. No. No. So the question is: Are global? Uh, is there any kind of global variable that uh, is passed down? Anything that you pass into uh, a function to to parameters that is going to be available in that function. But anything else from the from the parent scope, they're completely in in isolation of each other. They might happen to run on the same machine, but the next interaction might be uh, like. Like, like it was mentioned, another data center, another host, uh, maybe even a different operating system or a different ver a different version of PowerShell wouldn't happen. But cool. So let's get that output out of there. So we have our URI. So we can enter in our ID. Look at it. Expanding string. And now we have the basic for uh, for a fan out approach here. So what we can uh, what we can do by going uh, back into our orchestration function, uh, we can see here that uh, let's make this one. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. That was the wrong hotkey. And let's copy it back. There we go. Sweet. So what we can do here is uh, we can also uh, make sure that there's uh, some kind of uh, some kind of error handling here. So we could put try catch blocks in there if. Uh, if an activity uh, if an activity would fail or uh, a, a number of switch statements to have some kind of flow control so we can uh, so we can take uh, take into account uh, that a query might fail or you might have overloaded an API endpoint by sending too much uh, too many requests and those are things that you would uh, that you would uh, take into account inside of your orchestration uh, uh, function cool and then uh, going a bit uh, further. So currently, uh, what we have is uh, is we take uh, we we take our array. Our array is just one to ten. Uh, we execute it. Uh, we uh, we uh, we gather all this data. The next step can be to uh, gather more data. So this activity could also uh, we could also create a different activity. So let's take a look at the API endpoint and see what kind of things we can query. Other than that, we can get some kind of uh, information out of it. So let's go for item. I used to always do this with the Star Wars, uh, with, with the Star Wars API, but the movies have really been terrible lately. So <laughs> Pokemon it is now. Uh, we'll go for type. So what we'll do, uh, what we'll do now is we'll just uh, pretend that we're uh, gathering more information. Well, we are actually gathering more information about these Pokemon. So we create another function. So this will be another activity. Uh, and that is the activity. Yes. Then out and in. Get item address or type. Sweet. So once again, we we'll change it to ID. We have the URL there, and we can just use this one. 
And we can go into our activity function and make sure that we get all the output that we want out of this. Let's see. So we have the ID here again. And yep, so we wait for all the outputs. We already mentioned how many, so total amount of Pokemon. The next thing uh, we can do is for outputs and just code it in a for each block. And we can do like this. And then we take the get type. And we should also update this one so it actually goes to the correct one. So once get Pokemon sweet. So then we need to make sure that we actually get this one. So we're going to wait for all the async tasks to uh, output again. Uh, we know that it's going to be 10 at the same time because we just gathered 10 objects or I get, I suppose maximum 10 objects that we're going to, uh, that we're going to get out of this. And this one is output types. And then we have our functions created. So uh, we have two options now when we're developing, uh, when we are developing our uh, functions. So we can either choose to, uh, to, run it, uh, to run it locally or we can uh, push it to, uh, to Azure. If we want to run it locally, um, we can uh, run it from here or we can choose to uh, deploy it up to Azure. Uh, so we'll give it a second, then it will come up with our uh, with our function app. Yeah, uh, it will emulate uh, it will emulate uh, the the storage here. Uh, it will emulate the storage, and I I used to have more issues with this in the past because uh, obviously this uh, MacBook and I. I ran into uh, to issues with uh, debugging Azure Functions, but uh, these demos uh, have, have not failed uh, locally yet, but I'm still not chancing it because it has disappointed me too many times, so I'm just going to push it to Azure. <laughs> yep, yep, so uh, you need uh, Azure Functions. Uh, some of the requirements are you need the Azure Functions uh, uh, extension in there. Uh, there's nothing specific to durable functions that's just integrated in there. You need the Azure extension uh, the, uh, as well. So you need to be logged into Azure. Uh, I can show you that. Uh, up, uh, let's first push this while I talk. So what I'll do, there we go. Get a nice notification if I really want to deploy straight to production that we always, it's, it's not even Friday 5 p.m. So we can see here that we are uh, deploying, and in our uh, in our uh, output window, we can follow what is uh, what is happening uh, what is happening here. Um, yeah, as I was saying, uh, deploying into Azure, you need uh, the Azure extension as well. Uh, aside from that, you also need uh, the Azure Function CLI on uh, on your system, and that was. Part of the issues that I was having on, uh, on my MacBook previously is it had installed it to uh, Brew and to NPM, and then it got upset because there were two versions and it didn't know what to do. I also got upset. Uh, yep, so it's, we're pushing it up now. So in the meantime, I'll go over to our browser, see if we can 
see them show up. We can see that they're up there. I'm not sure if the deployment is completely uh, completely complete. You can see that the triggers are set to uh, uh, as activities and as uh, orchestration. And if we want to execute it now, we can either go into the uh, into the starter function uh, and type in the function name. And the function name we want to execute is going to be the orchestrator, not uh, the other functions. One of the things to uh, keep in mind of the orchestrator is that it should always be triggered to the uh, uh, to the activity uh, function. You can um, the activity the words the starter function. Um, but you can individually uh, execute your uh, your activity function. So if you want to do some testing with your activities, they are uh, as close as uh, as close to a regular Azure function uh, uh, as it comes in uh, in Azure durable uh, durable functions. And yeah, so what happens if we execute it? Uh, the orchestrator will start up. It will uh, it will check the state of the execution because the orchestrator doesn't know if it's the first time it's being started or that it's being called up to take take the next step. So it will always Take a look at the execution history and base its actions uh, uh, from there uh, to what it will uh, what it will actually execute. And yeah. Then the last part of this one, so we can see that it also gives us the uh, the URLs, so we don't have to uh, look it up anywhere else and make this one a bit smaller um, yeah the one thing I need to show on here then I do the rest in VS code uh, for deployment uh, currently everything is just deployed to master deployed to production but you can also uh, you can also configure the different uh, deployment slots, which is probably a good idea if you're uh, if you're using your Azure function for anything uh, more critical than just showing a cat photo or gathering Pokemon. So you can see this one uh, goes to production. You can uh, you can choose your deployment slots here and your deployment strategy uh, based uh, based on that. So. If we uh, want to take a look at some of our, to our Azure environment, so if you have the Azure plugin installed in your uh, in your VS Code, this is where you can uh, where you can also choose to uh, to create a new function app and use that as the deployment uh, uh, as the deployment uh, target. So if we want to do that, uh, we can go here and we get an option to create either a function app or uh, a resource group, but we can uh, we can create any kind of resource here. Alternatively, you could also use the COI or a PowerShell command to create a function app or use an ARM template or use bicep, whatever your, uh, whatever your jam is. And uh, one important thing that I missed out yet, uh, out on so far is uh, another critical extension is going to be VS Code Pets. That is definitely mandatory whenever you're developing this. And you, you, if you're waiting for the deployment to actually be pushed to Azure or uh, anything like that, uh, this one is, uh, I, I just like it. I get clippy in there. It's my, uh, it's my favorite extension. Actually, the person that developed uh, a lot of, uh, th that made the images for a lot of those pets is also the, the same guy that runs, uh, or that started the uh, Azure Functions University on uh, GitHub. Great, uh, great resource. Cool. So, the additional resources, I already mentioned that part. Uh, Azure Functions University, it's a GitHub repository. It has training materials for both durable functions and regular uh, Azure functions. Uh, and it's uh, basically a 
uh, a tutorial, like you get a goal, go to these steps and uh, you'll get, uh, get started. The samples on GitHub from, uh, from the Azure team itself uh, are sometimes a bit outdated, so uh, be careful to check how long ago the last commit was to a repo story because otherwise you might be uh, working with old code or code that was intended for an earlier version of uh, durable uh, functions. Uh, the Microsoft Docs are uh, a great resource uh, as well. And I realize that I'm uh, 15 minutes early, but at least we have plenty of time for, uh, for questions. Uh, yeah, so the, que the question is, it can, uh, uh, you can use the, the fan in, fan out uh, to, uh, for abusive purposes as well. To, and are you mostly concerned about your APIs being abused or no, your API, like, your fun? Uh, well, one of the things that we, uh, that we chose not to do uh, is uh, here we have the no weight parameter. So we can also make it weight. So then it's just one at a time, then it's already, uh, already less abusive. So yeah, to rephrase, the, 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 to repeat the question, the question was, is there any way that we can be sure that we don't just blast and uh, or give an API endpoint the hug of death because we are fanning out uh, so big? We can change the, oh, that's why we don't see anything. Here we go. So we can, uh, we can change the, the parameter to, uh, to actually, uh, actually wait. Uh, as for your own API, uh, your own API and uh, your own uh, function endpoints, you can put it behind an API management tool. Azure has some. There's a lot of third-party tools that can uh, can help you with uh, making sure that you don't get DDoSed or you you don't get charged an insane amount for uh, a lot of pointless uh, pointless executions. Yeah, yeah. So the question is that is there a runtime limit? Uh, uh, in one of the Azure Functions uh, slides, so before we got to durable functions, uh, I mentioned that it uh, is supposed to be short running, uh, short running functions. Uh, so it's between five and ten minutes. Uh, there's ways you can work around it if you want to have uh, longer execution times, but it is not recommended. Uh, it's uh, if you're if you're in a situation where you have to wait that long, uh, try to do things asynchronously. Try to have a function uh, call itself after a while so it doesn't kill itself or take care of it to the orchestrator or use, uh, use a different tool because uh, in general serverless, not just Azure Functions, is not intended to be, uh, to be used for long running tasks. Then Azure Automation might be, uh, might be a better tool if you, you have those really long, uh, long running tasks. So the addition from our uh, our co uh, from my co-speaker Justin <laughs> was that if you have a premium plan, so not the pay as you go, then you have more options in regards to uh, in, in regards to how long you can run it because you get your own instance. Additional benefit is also that your instance is, instances can be beefier than the regular ones. I, I think it was double double CPU double memory for uh, for the nodes. Yeah. Uh, no, this does not. So the question is, does this need to be quoted uh, within a string? Uh, no, it doesn't have to be unless there are spaces in there. Then you'll you have to escape it otherwise because it will think it's multiple uh, multiple parameters. So you don't have to uh, you don't have to put it in string. But I I do put it in uh, in strings because otherwise I'm going to run into a case that if I I'm not even sure if you can put spaces in uh, in function names. I, Never tried. I, I wouldn't expect so either, but uh, let's find out. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, all right then. Well, in that case, let's go back to the slide. If uh, any other questions uh, come up, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm on Twitter. You can reach out to me there. I'm uh, happy, to, uh, happy to help out. And uh, thank you for your time and uh, for showing up this, this early. Have a great conference.